If you pick up a newspaper, or watch TV, or listen to the news on your iPad or radio, you will find it hard to get through a whole broadcast without a headline about a politician or special interest group calling for some kind of radical change. <coughs> the Tea Party is calling for the federal government to be more fiscally responsible and cut spending, and the Democrats claim that the federal government uh, claim that the stimulus saved this co country from even a deeper recession, and one party wants to do away with the existing tax cuts or to extend them, and another one advocates for equi equitable tax increase. And the Occupy Wall Street people claim that they represent 99% of the population and that they're just fed up with the greedy and corrupt 1% who are wealthy. And their only solution is world revolution. The only consensus among all these groups is that some kind of change is needed. And it's needed right now. This is the same or very similar kind of diverse political excitement that's going along in ancient Israel. From the time when Moses died until the time of Samuel, who we start to read about now, the 12 tribes of the Israelites were led successfully by charismatic judges, people who had the gift to be a judge. When an enemy threatened, then a temporary leader would be raised up by God and justice would be restored. The decentralized and fragmented system began to fail in Samuel's time as internal and external pressures built up. Now the external threat came from the Philistines. These are sea people who'd moved into the region and settled the plains along the Mediterranean. The settlements had grown larger and larger until a five-city coalition had been developed and formed a really strong economic base. And then for three generations, through the lives of Solomon and the lives of Eli, the one who had raised Samuel, and now in Samuel's life, they had been terrorized by the Israelites. They had terrorized the Israelites, the Philistines, right? Armed with armed weapons, they eventually captured and carried away the Ark of the Covenant that held the Ten Commandments. Now Samuel was able to call the Israelites back to God's ways and convince them to throw away the idols of Bat Baal and Ashtoreth. And they were restored to being God's people again. And so throughout much of Samuel's leadership, the Philistines were held at bay and there was peace in the land. Well, at least for a while, until the internal pressures weakened the Israelites. The Israelite population had increased through birth and through cultural diversity, people moving into the region of the Israelites and marrying into their tribes. The people had prospered and began to accumulate wealth, and that needed to be defended. The increased population began to stress their food <coughs> supply because the hill country had reached its agricultural limits. And Samuel, their good leader, grew old. He appointed his sons to lead as judges, but they were corrupt. They accepted bribes. They did not do justice. They did not walk in the ways of their father. And the internal structure began to weaken the whole of the Israelites, and they became more vulnerable to the pressures from the Philistines. So it's not really a surprise that the elders, like so many of our political groups, began to demand change. And they asked for a king. Samuel took this request for new leadership quite personally, and I can understand that frustration and hurt. He had served for decades as a judge, traveling from city to city, and he'd been a good and fair judge. And judges not only went and dispensed justice in the cities, they also led people into battle, and he'd been an effective judge that way too. <coughs> 
holding the Philistines at bay and having peace reign throughout the land. He was a good prophet. He'd listened to God well. The Bible says all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. In fact, this book is named after Samuel. Even though Samuel dies partway through book one and book two, and the book mostly talks about the life of David, it's named for God's faithful servant, Samuel. So this man who listened to God really well and who led the people well, this is who receives the request for new leadership. His actions show the quality of character because he took his concerns straight to God to see what needed to be done. And God takes the sting out of the rejection of the people. He says, it's not you, it's me. He highlighted the people's repetitive pattern of sin. Listen to this, <coughs> this pattern and see if you fit in there anywhere. The people would experience hardship. And then they would call to God for relief. And God would hear their cries and he'd send them a leader like Moses to show them God's ways and to lead them to safety. And for a while, things go really well. And then the people become distracted. And they stop being focused on God. And they start doing their own thing. As God says, they forsake me and worship other gods. And then they run into problems. And then they cry out to God. And God speaks again through a prophetic leader. And the people repent again. And life gets back on the God track. And their things are good again until, well, you can see the cycle. I had someone tell me last week when I was on vacation that they were Christian but didn't feel it necessarily to go to church regularly. After all, life was good and they didn't need church. However, they continued, it was good that they were a member of a church because when life got tough, they could run right back there for support. Friends, you can't expect to prevent a first heart attack if you buy a gym membership and never go and exercise. Or to say it another way, we know that we have to exercise for optimal health. Well, we also need to be in prayer with God all the time and to be strengthened by our community of God regularly for optimal spiritual health. It's easy to fall in that pattern of sin. It uh, takes a bit of work to stay on the God track. God tells Samuel to listen to the people. Samuel needs to listen to the people because they are crying out for better leadership, for justice and good governance, for a reprieve from corrupt judges, and for the security from their threatening neighbor nations, particularly the Philistines. Because of Samuel's warning, we often take it that the request for a king is wrong. But the people's cries are valid. Historians suggest that faced with internal corruption and the Philistine threat, the Israeli, Israelite tribes had only two options. They could surrender to the Philistines, and that would be the end. Or they could change their internal structure to a more centralized form of power. With any centralized system like a king, you run the risk of having a king that's not so great, a king that demands obedience of their subjects, requires taxes, requisitions your property, drafts soldiers, takes your uh, women folk to be in service for the king. So by seeking the freedom from the Philistine threat, they risk becoming enslaved by their own king. Samuel delivered the warning, and the people repeated their call for change, saying, we want a king to reign over us like the other nations. We want a king to lead us, to go out before us into battle. They were just yearning for a new form of governance and some protection. God's not necessarily against kings. I know that warning is very strong, but... Even though 
show that this has come about through world events rather than God's initiating that direction. God has previously spoken about a king to them before. Genesis 17.6 God promised Abraham, I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And in Deuteronomy, where they're getting ready to go into Canaan, the land that God has promised them, you can see this, the foretelling of this request. Deuteronomy 17 teaches, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, and you've taken possession of it and settled it, and you say, let's have a king over us like all other nations, be sure to appoint a king that the Lord your God chooses. And then the passage continues with guidelines for kingly behavior regarding limited personal wealth and purity of heart and humility and staying God-focused. So he's telling them, you're going to ask for a king, and you need to choose someone who's going to be a good king. Samuel has a reputation as a good judge, but the tribal system had its problems. The very last sentence in the book of Judges, Judges 21-25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and all the people did what was right in their own eyes. So Samuel is the one chosen by God to be a transition leader, guiding the people through the shift from an inadequate tribal system to a monarchy. When Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them into the ears of the Lord, says the book, Samuel 8.22. And the Lord told Samuel, listen to their voice and set a king over them. God does not dominate or coerce us, but rather lures us through our current life situations towards a lively, abundant, faithful, and just way of living. Today, our country is not only about to vote in a new president, and we're in that transition time of political change. We're also in a period of change within our denomination. I bet many of you can remember when there wouldn't be just 25 people here, but then a time when the pews were full and the Sunday school classrooms were full. But now the culture around us has changed and our pews are only half full. We struggle because we remember what worked for us before. We want to go back. We want to have a choir. We want to have all those same children's programs. We want to go backwards in order to go forwards. But I don't think we can work that way. And so we go out looking for new ideas. And when we get that new ideas and we bring them into the church, the first thing that it does is it resonates with Samuel's displeasure and we want to shout, no, we've not done that before. We don't do that that way around here. But I want to be a leader that's more like Samuel. So when I'm presented with innovation, I hope to turn to God first to listen to that divine advice. And I want to hear the voices of our congregation. I want to hear the voices in our community. I want to hear the voices from the hearts of our young people who are not sitting in these pews with us today as they explain to us why religion isn't important to them. Somewhere among all those voices, we're going to find a way, a new way of telling about the story of our King, Jesus. The Israelites are given kings. Saul led first, and then David, and then many kings followed. And some will fall right in line with Samuel's dire predictions. And they'll they take, 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 and the not nation suffers. Others, like King Josiah, are going to bring spiritual reform. And they're going to walk in the way of the Lord. And the nation is going to enjoy peace. And God is eventually going to send the ultimate king, Jesus, to teach about servant leadership. And Christ is going to wear a thorny crown and give his life for us. And that's why I want to be like Samuel and listen and listen and listen. And I can't, because I can't imagine going through life 
without waking up every day in love with Jesus. The survival of the United Methodist Church is important to me. The growth of this church here, this local church, is one of my goals. But I am driven to share God's love. And sometimes I just want to weep when I meet people and they're facing hardships and they don't know that love. With, without Christ's forgiveness and without that sure and constant foundation undergirding the whole of life, people suffer so much more. I can't imagine even taking a single breath to sing happy birthday to a friend without exhaling the gratitude of love and to God for their very life. The joy of Jesus is contagious, and I just want to infect everybody everywhere. Time keeps going on, and here in the U.S., in this denomination, we began with these little societies that met in people's homes. And itinerant preachers that traveled from city to city, connecting all those little societies with the word of God. And eventually we began to build churches, and we began to organize them into districts, and we began to organize those into conferences, and finally we've got connections that string across the whole of our globe. Our United Methodist denomination has already spent decades, even centuries, adapting to new changes. But our foundation is always God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Samuel is one of those transitional leaders, listening to both God and the people to help others stay on that God track as they move from one form of government to another. People need the Lord. So let's listen and figure out how to bring the good news of Christ to them in a fresh, new way. Amen.